Hi, I'm Johan Tortran. I'm CTO and co-founder of Elasticis. We're a Swedish CNCF member, training partner and service provider. We also create our own Kubernetes distribution. I also have a spare time job as tenured faculty in computer science where I try to make microservices a bit more self-driving because we want self-driving cars and we want simplified use of IT. I've been researching and teaching distributed systems since the dark ages of soap-based web services. And I do remember vividly when Amazon Web Service introduced the fourth size VM. Today, I'm going to share some of the experience that we had in Elasticsearch in helping various companies who wanted to embrace cloud native technology and Kubernetes while still operating in a heavily regulated business sector. So, the title of my talk is Compliance Beyond Security. Let me elaborate a bit on that. It is well understood that. In order to comply with various regulations, you need a solid information security program. And in fact, there has been multiple talks in previous KubeCons on this topic, including quite a few stories about how to use search measures to achieve end-to-end -end encryption across all your microservices. I have nothing against service measures, but there's more to compliance than that. And today I want to bring attention to certain aspects of compliance that goes beyond traditional security or require you to take a different approach to security. So traditional information security standards says, such as ISO 27001 and SOC 2 focus a lot on topics such as confidentiality, integrity, and availability, the so-called CIA triad. More recent regulations such as the European Data Protection Regulation, GDPR, and the much-inspired California Consumer Privacy Act focus on a different aspect data privacy, and end-user rights to their data. To illustrate some of these needs with the regulation, let's do a mind experiment. Consider a scenario where you're running an online service and one of you, your users requests to unregister. How do you do that? Well, removing a user, that's pretty straightforward. We delete the corresponding record from our database or data stores, or even perhaps just mark that particular user as removed. Because, hey, after all, we hope that that user might change his or her mind and come back as a user. However, if our user instead requests to be forgotten, hmm, this is a much trickier question. Returning to our database example, it is clearly not sufficient just to mark this particular user as removed without actually removing that record, but what more? What other kind of data do we keep about our users? Where do we store it? How do we process it? And for what purposes? This is the topic I want to talk to you today about with a focus on the GDPR regulations. So we see an international trend of data privacy, most uh, prominent in Europe with the GDPR, which is a general protection of user data that regulates protection of data, sort of classical information security, privacy of data, and also limits how we can actually transfer this data. I will focus my talk on the two last aspects, the data privacy and data transfers. So while this GDPR regulation applies inside Europe, it's very important to remember that if you do business in the European Union, or even if you keep personal data about European citizens, GDPR applies to you, so this is not only a European concern. So, I previously mentioned personal data. What then is personal data? Well, this is both rather well-defined in GDPR and rather vaguely defined. So clearly, identifiers such as social security numbers or other numbers directly tied to individual persons are personal data. Similarly, a name is sort of an attribute of a person, but it may not be unique. But if you then combine the name with perhaps an age and a location where that particular person is living, you can identify that individual. And similarly, more abstract identifiers such as locations or even IP addresses has been deemed to be personal data. So in summary, all data that explicitly or implicitly identifies an individual is personal data. And the regulation here is future-proof in the sense that data that is today not really considered personal can be considered personal in the future. So we should be very careful about 
collecting when collecting data about personal opinions, diseases, religions, and the similar. So at any rate, if you process this type of information about users directly or indirectly, then you need to comply with GDPR. So let's talk about terminology a bit. In GDPR, we talk about the data subject, that is the person above whom you're collecting the data. The data controller, if you're running an online service and collect this data, you are the data controller. And then we also have data processors, and this is basically all the various type of providers you use for processing data that you collect about this person. So most prominently, this would be your cloud provider. So, GDPR brings out quite a few requirements on data processor. For example, you need a legal basis as one of the six reasons to collect this data. If you don't have a legal basis and consent, you're not allowed to collect data. And this is the reason that we see cookie consent pop-ups on every website we visit. They're asking for your consent to store the data in accordance to GDPR. Another example in GDPR is data minimization. You're supposed to collect only the minimal amount of personal data you need in order to do what you collect the data for. So, I mean, GDPR is a rather new regulation, but do mind that fines can be very severe. And this can be an impact for both small and large organizations. And, I mean, what we see here to the right is the sort of total amount of fines handed out for violating GDPR regulations. And it sort of starts slow and increases. And this is because in, in many different European countries, the data protection authorities took a very educating stance in the beginning, basically informing companies that they're not really complying with GDPR to only later, more recently, start handing out fines. So this would be your friendly parking attendant telling you that your car is incorrectly parked in this new street, so please don't do this in the future and you will get fined. So, interestingly enough, if we look at the top fines handed out here, we see that these are both handed to European and non-European countries. So your organization's place of registration doesn't matter here. And we can see two broad categories. We can see both that data has been used in an in appropriate way, and we can also see that some others are fined for not having sufficient protection capabilities around the data. So you need both a sort of top-notch information security system program and to, to actually use data in a proper way if you want to comply with GDPR. So two aspects of data privacy and GDPR compliance. The first one I like to call data obsolescence. So under GDPR, we no longer have the full and eternal right to use our data, and we need to plan accordingly. And then, we also need to be careful about data transfer, most prominently use of cloud computing services, as this is only allowed if these services operate under legislation from countries with sufficient privacy protection. We'll talk more about that. So let's look at the first challenge for data obsolescence, observability. We've been told many times that observability is a great way to find out what's happening with your running system. So we keep metrics to see how, how things are running, what kind of utilization we have and so on. We do logs to be able to do detailed debugging later, and we may even use distributed tracing to pinpoint performance issues. So I mean, we're trying to ensure that our users are happy, our applications run as they should, and that our servers and infrastructures are not overloaded. I mean, this is all good and all fine. However, under GDPR, we also need to be mindful that are we using observability in a manner that keeps our regulators happy? Because collecting all of this data needs to be done for a, for a good purpose. The other challenge to data obsolescence is availability. And then, in particular, high availability is important for any business. So, I mean, recent news highlight the need for high availability. And in fact, in the ability to be able to operate as normal, even despite major failures, is important. And I mean, this is highlighted then in many regulations, such as ISO 27000. And 
Such criteria are commonly described as business continuity. Even if disaster strikes, there should be continuity to your business. And not as illustrated by this recent boating incident. So, to achieve high availability, we commonly use standard practices such as replicating critical components so that our systems can tolerate failure of a single component. But overall, this increases data fanout, and personal data tends to be replicated both in many places, perhaps even across geographic regions, availability zones, or even cloud providers. So we, we're spreading our data far and wide for availability reasons, but this has implications on privacy. So, in summary, let's revisit this cloud-native train map that many of you are familiar with. And personally, I've always been wondering why there are so many dragons in this figure. But for the sake of this discussion, we note that here we have a few dangers in terms of data obsolescence. And here there are two main problematic categories, observability and database of storage, where we tend to collect more data than what is allowed from a GDPR perspective, and we tend to keep it for longer and in more locations than is strictly required, and this may give us troubles. So in essence, we are data hoarders. We're collecting data about our users all, out, all throughout our systems, and we keep them for longer than we perhaps necessarily need, and in more places. Whereas GDPR is very strict that we need to minimize data, so we're only allowed to collect data for the purpose of, of the actual collection and store it as long as needed. So for example, if you're doing detailed logging to debug some login session in one of your microservices, it makes a lot of sense to store some logs to see what's going on, but frankly, storing these logs for much longer than needed for a sort of immediate debugging is likely not in accordance to GDPR, because two weeks down the road, you probably know whether that user managed to log in successfully or not, and you, don't, you no longer have a valid reason to store that data from a GDPR perspective. So, the solution I would like to propose here is really retention. So do collect what kind of data you have, but keep it only as long as it's reasonable for the, for the sake you're collecting it. So do rotate your metrics, your logs, and your traces accordingly. And then backups, very interestingly, according to a recent French court ruling, are not, are not really subject to data minimization and the right to be forgotten under GDPR. So if your user asks to be forgotten, you don't need to erase any backup containing data about that user. However, if you do perform some sort of disaster recovery or restore from backup, you need to remember that you forgot about that particular user, otherwise you can end up in trouble. The second point I want to make here is about data transfers. So why should we really care about that? So here to the right we see a map of the world with a certain few regions highlighted. And this could be the location of past and upcoming cube counts once we get the chance to meet again in person. But for this particular talk, talk, the map highlights where the largest cloud providers in the world are incorporated. And GDPR states clearly that you, the data controller, is responsible, I mean, not only for your own GDPR compliance, but also for the data processors, that is, your cloud providers. And what we also know is that many of the largest cloud providers are not European companies. So, why is this important? Well, up until this summer we had a legal framework for data transfers between Europe and the United States under a framework which was called the Privacy Shield, which allowed European countries to safely transfer data to the US and ensure that they comply with GDPR. And this was the second incarnation of such a framework. Previously there was something called a safe harbor that turned out not to be safe according to court ruling, so that was invalidated. And later on, we had a privacy shield. However, same story can, comes over once again. So this particular summer, one European, the European Court of Justice basically said that the privacy shield is no longer valid. So without going into too much details, this is a really a clash of cultures, whereas in the US, there's a strong culture of the state having the right to citizens' data for security reasons, versus in Europe, there's a strong culture of uh, 
you as the individual having the right to your own data. And similarly, not at the state, but at the company level, there's a, there's a big difference in, the, in your right to user's data versus the user's right to own their own data. So this is a mind shift. So what will happen then in the future? Will we have another data transfer agreement? So while searching for the ocean, I found this very neat idea of the iron fence, perhaps inspired by the iron curtain that will be valid all up, in, up, up until 2038, after no longer transfers of data over the internet is possible. So joke aside, because this was published on April the 1st, given this clash of culture and law, there's very li unlikely that there will be a new data transfer agreement between Europe and the United States. So what are my options? Well, the European Court of Justice upheld so-called standard contractual clauses or binding corporate rules as one valid mechanism for data transfer. However, this places a lot of burden on the data processor, that is you, to determine whether there's sufficient protection for data privacy with your processors. And honestly, this not, does not look very promising. So you may also try to get the consent from your user for your type of processing, but this is very tricky because you need to gather consent for each individual type of processing. You may not only ask your user to sign a general consent because then you don't really minimize the, data, the use of the data. Well, let's try to anonymize the data, pseudonymize the data, or even encrypt the data before transferring it to some of the clouds in, in the US. Well, I mean, this is doable, as we can do encryption at rest and encryption in transit, but however, as we cannot do encryption in use as the good, in a good manner, this very much limits the use of such uh, external sub-processors. The road we really recommend here is to try to then limit the reliance on external cloud services and try to run services containing sensitive data on European providers, including your, you as your own provider. So how do you do that? Well, cloud native technology and Kubernetes to the rescue to achieve cloud agnostic compliance because with cloud native technology, we can build our application stacks in such a way that we can run them in large hyperscale clouds outside of Europe and also in our own data centers or on smaller European clouds, all without vendor lock-in. Just to illustrate this concept, so if you're running some services on Amazon and you're using certain type of technologies, there are nowadays good uh, alternatives in the cloud native space, such as using Kubernetes instead of some compute service or EKS, using uh, Kube, or sorry, Knative product for serverless and so on. I won't go through the full list, but in essence, the kind of most fundamental services that you would need to construct your application and that you can get from a big uh, hyperscaler cloud, you can create yourself using cloud native technologies. But however, that will put a lot of burden on you to fulfill uh, GDPR compliance and to ensure that your data is safe and that you fulfill privacy needs. So in essence, just because you're using Kubernetes and cloud native technology doesn't mean that you're secure or that you're compliant. So in the time remaining, I would like to discuss some of the subtle technical challenges when implementing GDPR or similar regulations using cloud native technologies. So we reviewed GDPR and found that there's quite a few, let's call them more technical articles, suggesting at various types of information security capabilities. And some of these may reside at the physical level, others at the platform or Kubernetes level, Yet others are more about your applications or even your processes in your organization. But let's focus what we can solve at the Kubernetes level here. So looking at GDPR in Article 25, it mandates that data protection must be by design and by default. So unfortunately, Kubernetes is not really secure by default due to its desire to preserve this sort of, wow, it just works branding. What we need to do here then is to uh, 
bring in some additional technologies from the cloud native landscape and configure Kubernetes in certain ways to make it more secure. So just to exemplify, we can use something like Dex, so an open ID connect to ensure that we're really connecting to our clusters as individuals that can be traced back to specific persons. So I would really like to know that it's Yuan, the person logging into this Kubernetes cluster, not just some uh, anonymous uh, administrator account that tries to do exchanges. And similarly, we would like to use something like role-based access control to actually limit what this administrator is allowed to do versus some other things. And if you want even more fine-grained uh, access control, you can look at something like OPA and its gatekeeper project. So let's look at Article 33 and 34, which is notification of data breaches. GDPR mandates that upon a data breach, you really need to notify the data, the data subject. And here we can use cloud native tools such as Falco for intrusion detection that captures everything that's going on in our cluster and gives us warnings about very suspicious activity. I would recommend combining that with detailed logging, perhaps through Elastic and Kibana to store not only application logs, but actually audit logs from Kubernetes control plane to understand what is going on. So if we get a suspicious Falco alert, we can look to our audit logs and see, was this only our internal development team that deployed a new function or a new version of, of some application that did something that Falco picked up, or is this really a sign of, of an ongoing attack? So, I mean, by these examples, I illustrate how we can use cloud native technologies to create an information security management system and thus fulfill some of the aspects for compliance. And to illustrate how to combine these kind of tools, we created what we call compliant Kubernetes, where we basically use a lot of well-known cloud native technologies to implement the technical capabilities required to achieve compliance with GDPR or similar regulations. And this is just one possible such rendering. You may replace some of these technologies with similar scoped products to achieve similar goals. So if you want to take a look at how we did it, please check out our open source product and we would love your feedback and all contributions. To sum up, uh, compliance regulations such as GDPR requires strict handling of personal data and failure to do so may result in crippling fines. We need sufficient information security for data protection, but we also need to minimize the data we collect, so no more data hoarding. And also we need to implement the right to be forgotten, for example, through tight data retention. Furthermore, the end of the privacy shield raises a barrier for transferring data from the European Union to the US. Unfortunately, through cloud native technology, we get the building blocks we need to build our own cloud agnostic compliance toolkit. And a final shout out, please check out Compliant Kubernetes, our own rendering of a cloud native technologies for compliance. If you like it, please give us a star or even contribute. Thank you for your attention. I'm now ready to take questions.